Yo, yo, is Jordan Peterson really a fascist? Hey, what's up? Welcome to Dancing With Ideas. I'm Austin Hayden, a professional artist and philosopher, and this is the final word on whether or not Jordan Peterson is really a fascist. What do you think of the things that people, and I'm especially thinking of your opponents, get wrong about you? Their basic proposition is that, you know, first of all, that I'm a right winger of some sort. That's just not the case. Jordan Peterson is an academic, a clinical psychologist, and popular YouTuber whose content has been viewed over like 150 million times, and whose last book, Telling Men to Stand Tall, Clean Their Rooms, and Wash Their Penises, was a worldwide bestseller. But he's courted controversy for his very open opposition to many contemporary social issues that he deems to be part of the radical left, which has led some commentators to refer to him as being a part of the far right and even fascist. So here's three reasons why Jordan Peterson is not in fact a fascist, but how he is flirting quite heavily with what I will call the logic of fascism. And there's a distinction here that matters and I'll explain why later. There's been an obsession with categorizing people as alt-right, alt-light, new right, etc., etc., with the rise of Trumpism in 2015. Factions have split between old centrism, populism with the Bernie and Corbyn movement, and Trumpism, which is sometimes referred to as authoritarian neoliberalism, economic nationalism, and the like. But part of the problem here is categorization. Sometimes it's too easy to just stick any sort of particular individual into prefabricated categories, and in the process you end up losing a little nuance that is probably really important for us to consider. So who is Jordan Peterson? Well, let's listen to him describe himself to, or about, 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 to, about himself. I don't like the emphasis on equity or diversity or inclusivity or all of these buzzwords. I don't like the damage they've done to universities. I don't like the spillover of that into broader society. I don't like the totalitarian presuppositions. I don't like the history of radical leftist murderousness. I don't like, I don't like, and I don't like. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that didn't quite help. That tells us quite a bit about who he's grumpy with, but positively speaking, what does he actually believe? Politically, I'm a classic British liberal. Temperamentally, I'm high in openness, which tilts me to the left, although I am also conscientious, which tilts me to the right. Philosophically, I am an individualist, not a collectivist of the right or the left. Metaphysically, I'm an American pragmatist. Okay, so putting aside the whole, like, uh, metaphysical pragmatism for now, what we can get out of this is that he describes himself as a classical liberal. So what is a classic or classical liberal? Essentially, he's saying that he's a liberal, someone who tries to be kind to individuals and someone who advocates, more than anything, individual freedom. This means that he doesn't think the state or any sort of bureaucratic institution should infringe upon, for example, anyone's free expression or free speech. Therefore, as a self-described classic liberal, JP advocates for personal and economic freedom. He also advocates for self-determination, which means that he centrally is concerned with people's moral disposition in and to the world. We might call classic liberalism the ethical framework of of capitalism. Which makes perfect sense that he would be drawn to this designation because his whole shtick is basically being centrally concerned with morality. Who would like men to regain or reclaim their strength physically, mentally and morally? Is that broadly correct? I would say morally, fundamentally, but I think the other things go along with that. Further, JP espouses what's called a horseshoe theory about the far right and what he calls the radical left. Basically, eliminating any distinction between the two camps and uniting them around a common critique, collectivism. That is, both far right and radical left for Peterson refuse the ability of the individual to express him or herself morally in favor of a collective consciousness or group thought. He even goes so far as to proudly declare that uh, in his career over the decades what he's proudly fought against and tried to warn young people of is the potential spirit of fascism that lurks within them. I've warned thousands of students over the course of three decades that the spirit of Auschwitz concentration camp guards dwells in their heart and that they should do everything in their power to recognize its existence and overcome it. Notice how he puts exclusive attention on the individual effort to fight against the fascism within, that only you or I or him or her or them or whatever is able to wage. Which leads us to point two. He's simply an individual moralist. As a moralist, he's opposed to any sort of collective ideology. Right, left, up, down, sideways, roundabout, whatever 
However, he doesn't like any of it. As he sees it, by placing personal responsibility at the center, he's actually waging war against all forms of collectivism, fascism included. Therefore, by advocating for personal responsibility, JP believes that he's actually providing an antidote for people to war against the potential pressures or the influence of any sort of collectivist thinking and therefore any sort of potential for fascism itself. So by telling dudes to stand up straight and clean their rooms, not a bad idea in itself, right? He believes that what he's doing is he's actually giving them the resources to be able to war against some sort of potential tumultuous nature within. But wait! However, we can tie this moralism directly into what I'm calling the logic of fascism, and we'll do that right after we cover the third reason why he's not a fascist. Okay, 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 okay. So this one is a bit theoretical, so just bear with me for a minute. I've been largely influenced by the philosophy of Jean-Paul Sartre, the better JP, in my humble opinion. <laughs> For Sartre, you are what you're not, and you're not what you are. What? This means that the human never just is what it is. It is what it is. From mundane activities to just starting your day so you can go crush it as a barber to the kind of more exciting ones, like when you get to cut a zero fade flat top for your boy with little eyebrow slits. All of these activities are expressions of freedom as we're transcending the present, we're transcending our current status towards an open field of endless potential. There's a sense in which there's this constant process of self-creation in absolute freedom that characterizes the human spirit. So we are what we're not in that what we are is an endless field of possibilities. Bro, what are you talking about, man? Of course, the flip side is that you're not what you are, which means basically chill out and stop thinking that you simply are those rigid narratives that you tell about yourself to other people and even to yourself. And this is why we can say that Peterson is not a fascist, only in the sense that we are always in a process of becoming, and the only way we can really make such a final designation about something is only in the abstract mode. But this leads to a big but. And of course, as a philosopher, I'm a huge fan of big butts. Jordan Peterson may not be a fascist, but he certainly flirts with what I'm going to call the logic of fascism. And I mean like big time flirting, like slide into your DMs, follow all your socials, subscribe to your OnlyFans level of thirst. So how does this work? Well, Peterson has a tendency to essentialize. What's wrong with essentializing, you ask? Well, it suppresses difference. It reduces everything to a singular foundation. The problem is that that singular foundation itself is never contested. It's never explained. It simply is what it is. It is what it is. It is, it is what it is. it is. All the while covering how that essential reality itself was constructed in the first place. It simply is what it is. I'm sorry it's come to this, but nevertheless, it's, it is what it is. So my real concern is actually how this established supposed reality is constructed in the first place and where it comes from. Hot dog mowing philosopher and psychoanalyst Slavoj Žižek makes a distinction that is helpful between the hysteric and the obsessive. The logic of the hysteric is characterized by telling a truth in the guise of a lie. The obsessive claims it's telling the truth but it's really a truth that serves a lie. Zizek uses the example of Nazi Germany to describe the logic of the obsessive. There, the claim to truth was that it was Jews and gays and the non-neurotypical that were the source of social unrest and anxiety. This made it easy for them to blame the other and really do any mother cussing thing that they wanted to do in order to justify their solutions because it was all in service of what they purported to be reality. The logic of the hysteric, on the other hand, would have been more proper properly attuned to the actual structural and material causes that were facing interwar Germany, what Peterson does by being an obsessive is basically he essentializes human nature by kind of using a sort of Hobbesian view of a violent human nature that he then purports as being foundational. This then covers over the structural and material conditions that would probably better reveal to us the sources, the causes of social conflict. So it's JP's obsessive traits that really demonstrates his 
flirtation with the logic of fascism. Rather than being better attuned to the structural and material conditions of economic inequality, gender divisions, racial conflict, etc, 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 Peterson covers over those more integral conditions in favor of symptomatic and superficial explanations for how things are the way they are. They are dying, that's true, and you ha it is what it is. Conclusion, what's the real problem with JP? He's a therapist for the disaffected, and he's trying to give resources to people who don't yet know how to live, trying to give them purpose. Again, that doesn't sound so horrible, right? And he's appealing to people who are feeling the weight of economic collapse and social anxiety and ecological breakdown. But the problem is that all of his solutions really derive from a fear, a fear of this dark shadow of human nature. So while JP sees himself as a great advocate of individual freedom, the great irony here is that he provides solutions that are ultimately just forms of of obsessive control, rather than actually something that would really stimulate a positive freedom. He offers a way of seeing the world and of living in the world that is rigid AF. And of course, it is that rigidity that is part and parcel of the logic of fascism. So is JP a fascist? No, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something perhaps more insidious even going on here. Because fascism isn't always coming at us like some domineering a-hole wearing faux military garb. Sometimes it's just in the way we think, in the way we behave, in the way we express our emotion. Which means that the logic of fascism isn't so easily identifiable and extinguishable. So what do you think? Is JP dangerous or are lefty snowflakes just butthurt? Comment down below and let me know what you think and why you think what you think. That's it, I'm out. Like, subscribe, share.